So mostly I just wanted to make sure everybody both saw the email from leadership about open positions, uh, as well as think hard about whether or not either you or someone you know might be able to fill one of those positions. So there are nominations being accepted for the coordinating committee, which is, I think that's a, I think they said that's a three year uh, stint for that. And then this interest group, I'll be rotating out at the end of the year. So if somebody's interested in being a co-chair for the, this interest group, that, that will be an open opportunity. And we can start talking about it now to see if anybody has any questions about that or is interested in that. So there, there are various levels of leadership opportunities. If you're interested in being more integrally participating in the NDSA, these are ways that you can do that. So I would, I would encourage you to, to think about that as a possibility if you think it's something that you might want to do. So Eric, can you think of other housekeeping matters that we need to discuss? Um, but off the bat, um, I mean, definitely like, well, just to, as a comment uh, in terms of um, nominations and everything, I mean, I, I've got, so this is my, this is basically my first year here and then I'll be on for another year. Um, so yeah, definitely if anybody's interested in teaming up, um, just let me know or let, let Lee and I know and, um, be happy to give you any information um, that would be helpful in terms of making that decision. Um, so, um, otherwise, housekeeping, I just put a link in uh, the chat there for the agenda for today for running notes. So, uh, if, yeah, it looks like some folks have already gotten there, if you could add your name to the attendance list. Um, and I don't know if we have anybody who's new here today. Um, but if this is your first meeting, uh, please feel free to add uh, your name under the new members section there. Okay, it looks like uh, folks are putting their names up there. Um, so, all right. So, Catherine, um, I, yeah, Catherine Ankaro is uh, joining us from CDL as well. Um, so maybe uh, Catherine, we usually ask anybody who's new to just basically give you a quick intro if you could. I would be happy to. Hi, um, I am Catherine Ankaro. I work at the California Digital Library and I am the Associate Director for the UC Curation Center. I work with Eric and a number of other people that you likely know. Um, I've followed your work, um, but I wanted to finally come and actually participate in one of your meetings. And I hope I'll be a more regular attendee. Um, you know, I handle a number of different things, not the least of which is digital preservation. Um, and so I'm, uh, I hope to be able to, to contribute, but I suspect that I will learn a lot more than I'm able to contribute. So thanks for, for having me today. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay, well, so why don't we go ahead and um, get started uh, on this presentation here um, about characterization. So, um, you know, Lee and I were, were uh, emailing back and forth over the past few weeks, just trying to figure out how we wanted to, um, to go about this. Uh, so we'd ask folks to, to chime in, but I know a lot of folks are out on, uh, on break or just literally dealing with all the crazy work that's leading up to the new school year. Um, so in, um, in lieu of like gathering a lot of info, um, what I wanted to do is I, we actually had a, uh, a, an effort in the past at CDL to uh, explore characterization for our uh, repository, which is Merit. Um, and it's something that's come back up in our conversations about future directions, because at that time when we, we actually went into this whole uh, exploration phase. Um, we we did a little bit, but we didn't really um, commit to it, and didn't really. Um, I mean, we 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 did some implementation, but you know, decided not to go that direction. So um, I kind of wanted to get back into that uh, and kind of 
talk about what we did, uh, some of the questions we asked, and also just explore some of the uh, the tools that are out there, um, and you know, give people a chance to kind of chime in uh, about some of these same questions, maybe from the perspective of their their own projects. So let me go ahead and share out my uh, this presentation here. Um, share out my screen. So, and I want to make sure, okay, good. Can folks see that okay? Yes. Okay, all right, great. So this is going to be a combination of kind of walking through some of the slides and then um, also taking a look at some of the, the basic reporting that we have uh, being provided through the repository, and then also some of the, the tool output um, that uh, I was able to come across. Um, so it's gonna be a combination of stuff. So let me just go ahead and uh, the presentation button and get going here. So yeah, this is uh, just as, as the intro, like I said, this was a past effort. Um, we really, uh, we got only so far and adding some of the characterization uh, to link to merits, which was basically in, you know, for every single ingested object, we would do a certain amount of, run a certain amount of tooling in the background and gather some of that information. Um, but like I also said, it has, it has a lot of questions uh, that we actually came across um, that I'm hoping will be useful for, for folks to explore here. Um, so in terms of characterization and a definition, um, you know, they're, they're I, I ran across several different definitions, um, and I'm I'm not going to say I'm an expert in this at all, um, and so I'm, that's why I'm also very happy to be talking about it here. Uh, let's see, you know, what other information people can share. But you know, characterization is all about defining the technical characteristics uh, of a particular file and gathering that and saving that as as technical metadata. Um, but it's also about identifying, you know, the the file at hand through using a file signature. Um, there are resources out there like Pronom um, that define a whole slew of file signatures, and those resources are constantly updated, uh, which is which is really great. There are tools out there that interface with things like Pronom, so when you're examining the different files, um, you can you can get that signature information and match it up against what's in the file. Um, and then there's this whole validation aspect uh, as well, if you want to kind of go further down the road and validation is really about trying to find out how valid is the file that you have in comparison to its specification. Um, we, you know, there's a certain amount of information that really should be there, um, structural information, but also, you know, how well formed is that particular file and that in some ways, um, in some formats, that's pretty straightforward In other formats, that's really not straightforward at all. Um, and I think that's, that is what is interesting about characterization, at least from from you know my standpoint, is is that this is this is not a cut and dried thing. There there's a lot of opportunity out there to be to encounter different information through these tools that's conflicting or incomplete or um, you know would cause you to to flag a particular file um, you know and and kind of raise that up for for more scrutiny. Um, and then that's part of, you know, of course, that's part of why the whole effort is there, um, is to be able to warn anybody who has content in your repository about, you know, particular pitfalls that are coming up. Whether it has to do with this entire file format is kind of going out the door and not going to be supported anymore, um, or if there are literally just, you know, problems with specific files that have been ingested into the system, and it gives you the opportunity to either, you know, re-ingest them or correct them or find out what's wrong. Um, so with just as a very quick overview, single slide about what our repository um, uh, encompasses, is it's, it's an open source, uh, you know, most everything that we have for the repository is, is open source. Of course, we, we don't have everything out there just because, you know, there's configuration information and stuff like that. Um, but it's it's managed by the UC3 team at CDL, um, and it really serves all the librarians and researchers that are um, within the University of California, and also researchers outside of the University of California, uh, specifically uh, through Dryad. Um, so a lot of what's in there is li digitized library special collection content, 
Um, we have all of our e-scholarship journals, all the open access articles uh, for a free scholarship in there, and, and of course, the dry out data sets. And do please feel free to stop me at any point in time with any questions. Um, so Merit at this point does provide a little bit of characterization um, with every ingest, but it's you know it's pretty um, pretty minimal. It's still very nice to have. Um, we've integrated with Apache Tika, and um, that provides us with mime type information. That's not nearly as extensive as something as Pronom, and you know we're not getting to file format signatures or validation uh, or anything like that. Um, but we can at least capture what MIME type every single file as it comes in. Um, we capture, of course, the file size in bytes, and then we generate uh, digests for these um, by default at uh, SHA-256 digest. Um, and then we have some reporting that's also, um, I'll give you guys a, a little bit of a tour of some of that reporting with regard to MIME types uh, a few slides from now. So what's really missing? Um, we, like I said, we don't get into signatures. We don't use an external resource like Pronom, um, although you know, it would be wonderful to actually go that route. Um, so we don't have the ability to say, oh, well, this signature matches. But um, there are also times I've heard where the tooling that interacts with Pronom might actually flag a file with multiple uh, identifi identifiers, basically saying this, this matches more than one pattern that we've seen. Um, we're going to raise this to you, and you can make your own decision about what this file actually is. Um, the validation part, as I mentioned as well, is not happening. Um, so that, you know, that to me is, um, those are two of the main opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, but in order to figure out whether or not we really want to go this direction, uh, we have a whole slew of questions that we originally asked in this past project. Like things like, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, can we start small? And um, do we, you know, perform only format identification or characterization and validation also? Um, where do we store all this stuff? Uh, there's potential for a lot of metadata to come out of characterization. I don't think it would be an overwhelming amount of information. Um, I mean, not in terms of size. So um, a little little later on in this presentation, we'll talk about how many individual files are in merit. And if you know you do a quick like back of the napkin calculation, if we had, so many kilobytes of information for every single file, it still wouldn't amount to, you know, more than, you know, 10 or 20 gigs or something like that. So it's not like a, we couldn't find a place to store that. Um, but then other questions are like, you know, if we have to go back and backfill all this information, which we will have to, if we, if we actually, um, you know, start down the characterization path, you know, how long is that going to take? And how long do we dedicate, like how much you know, computing do we dedicate to that and how often? Um, and which files do we process? We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then of course, the last but not least for sure is like what tools do we use? So let's go through these, these questions um, one by one and talk a little bit more about them. Um, so really, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, gather more information about all the files in Merit. Um, and in this case, there are millions of files in Merit. So um, we really, you know, we can spend a lot of time doing this. But it's, you know, providing the users, our, our you know, campus users with a dashboard view of what's in there, um, you know, and flagging problems, um, you know, coming up with some amount of guidance regarding the stability of the formats that they have in their collections. Uh, those those three major points um, would all be uh, the reason to go down this road, basically. So can we start small and upgrade the service over time? This is one of those key questions we asked during this effort uh, a little while ago. Um, to us, I think it's, and this is going to vary for, for everybody, um, but to us, you know, we have uh, over 20 million different producer files in the system. Um, the 55 million, like, figure that I mentioned here is really uh, a combination of producer and system files. 
And there's no reason to run characterization on those system files. The system files are really all about um, telling us more information about each individual ingest uh, in case the database goes down, um, which we have, we have a central database in Merit. And if we, you know, if there's some kind of catastrophic event and that database ceases to exist in some way, shape or form, which I sincerely hope will never happen, um, you know, we can use those system files to restructure a lot of the information that that was in the database, but they we wouldn't benefit by characterizing those. Um, so for us, really starting with a scalable solution makes more sense, you know, trying to build this into one of the microservices that the repository, uh, you know, operates. Um, as, as opposed, I mean, we, we of course have our staging environment and we could do a whole lot of testing in, you know, that environment and also uh, <clears throat> in, in our development environments. But, um, you know, this is a this is an approach. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is an approach where we would want to be using, you know, the APIs that these tools have to offer, as opposed to running things on command line or anything like that. So, um, yeah, that that question is pretty straightforward for us. Um, so, only file format identification or characterization as well. Um, you know, to me, this question is already answered. Um, but you know, one of the things that that uh, our lead developer and uh, Terry Brady's not on this call right now, but he's joined us in the past for these. Um, you know, it's like what, we we've talked about that question. Like, should we do this? Um, how many times for for being a, a bit level preservation repository? How many times have we encountered? a file format that is, you know, unstable or problematic or will be literally, it's like on the DPC bit list, like endangered species, you know, kind of like classification where this thing's going to be going away. We have to figure out a way to migrate it now uh, or else, you know, that's not going to be a pretty picture um, or, you know, somebody will, that content and that collection will, definitely benefit from migration. Um, we'd want to, we would want to know that. Um, but I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we have to go back to all the campuses and to all of our stakeholders and um, really talk to them and see what value they place on characterization uh, and validation, identification, all that sort of thing. Um, there are a couple of campuses that have this in place for some of their local systems. And it sounds like it's very it's very valuable to them. Um, so I would want to start with them first. Um, but then, you know, really it's it's a system-wide evaluation for us, I think, is what's pending. So where do we store the results? Um, you know, where do we store all this this metadata? Um, do we put it in a central database? Do we have um, you know, we have other places that we keep it? Uh, do we, you know, augment the system files that we already have in place, the system files that I just mentioned? Um, do we add more system files for object? Right now, there are already seven or, or eight, depending on, on the object that are there. They're really tiny files, but, you know, they take up a little space. Um, or do we put this uh, actually, you know, uh, someplace completely separate? Uh, in addition to the database or in some other type of storage, um, yeah, where do we put all this stuff? Um, and I, I think that's going to be, you know, a systems design type question and um, how do we architect it? Um, but at least we have a bunch of options. I would personally, I would rather not like actually augment the objects uh, with any additional metadata because this is a, basically taking a snapshot of them for a totally separate purpose, but um, that's just me. And how do we actually report the results? Um, you know, one of the tools that we came across when we first looked into this was C3PO. Um, and I have to pronounce it that way for some reason. Um, but it is, it, it looked like a very promising tool. Um, it's no longer maintained, uh, which I'm, I'm kind of bummed about. Um, but it was one of those efforts where, uh, the characterization that was taking place was using this tool called FITS, and FITS actually wraps around a whole slew of different 
utilities, which is really neat. Um, it comes up with a lot of information uh, that's very useful. Um, and then C3PO uh, actually added a sort of dashboard web interface uh, that you could take a look at the results of all this of the process. Um, and so from that perspective, it looked like a really useful tool, um, but it was an alpha forum. And uh, at this point, it just doesn't seem like it's gonna be maintained or picked up by anybody. So um, at least it's, you know, it's gonna be an aware of what it did and maybe we could set it up to see what that dashboard looks like and kind of, you know, see if that's something we would wanna to try to replicate on our side. Um, the other point here is should we augment our current reporting system or admin tool that we have for uh, for merit because um, right now what this provides is at least it provides reporting on the mind type uh, results that we have per file and per collection and per campus so it rolls up uh, in that way um, so it's you know definitely when I'm sending this kind of information out to uh, you know, to the owners of the collections or, you know, to the libraries or, um, you know, they find it very useful to have. Um, so from just mentioning that, I just want to jump out of this um, presentation and just go ahead and take a look at, it's a very, you know, basic 1999 interface that we have, but the good part about this interface is that um, you'll note there's a download JSON button um, we can get all this information out of the system and into a JSON file that I can then put into some other type of reporting or dashboard building software like Tableau. Um, so this is just a really quick snapshot of a single uh, collection that's in Merit. It's a very simple collection. There's a lot of content in it, but it really only has WAV files, image files, and XML. Um, and this is actually a content, uh, a collection from UCLA uh, that has, um, we're going to have many more ingests into this, um, but right now it's got about 18,000 different WAV files in it. Um, and it's for a, a local foundation um, uh, that has all sorts of interesting, great uh, um, cultural music in it. Um, so this you can see is very straightforward, but then if we move on and we kind of roll into a different collection, on the other hand, this, this collection right here encompasses all the different Dryad data sets that are out there. And if I just filter, uh, you can see that there's kind of a, uh, on the left-hand side here under MIME group, um, this is a basic taxonomy that we've set up, which just says, okay, we know all the different MIME types we can come up with which MIME types belong to you know, a category such as video or text or software or, or still images or you know, anything like that. Um, so you can see that there's a, a really wide variety of different um, MIME types and different file types in here. Um, you know, clearly there are, there are favorites uh, like text and XML, um, but then there are some file formats, lots of file formats in here that I that never come across before. Um, and so it's, you know, it's super interesting to be able to roll this data up and display it. Um, and then uh, one level up from there, um, we can actually display this kind of information uh, across an entire campus, or in this case, this is all of the different CDL collections that we have. Um, and we can, again, filter, but yeah, it's, you know, you're getting to the point where you can actually say we have certain, like within the entire corpus or within a particular campus, you know, they are heavy on text and image. They're heavy on, um, you know, video or moving image or other things like that. Um, and that's, you know, that's eventually uh, some good information to work with. Um, and also the beginnings, I guess you could say the beginnings of, you um, uh, taking a look at whether some of maybe you're collecting policies in different departments are actually doing what you think they're doing. Um, so that's just a, a quick few screens um, about what we currently report. Um, let me go back through here. Um, actually, let me, let me just pause there. Is, are, do folks have any questions at, at this point? Let's see. 
All right, I'll, I will keep going. And keep an eye on the time. So yeah, how long will it take to process these, process these collections? Um, that's of course gonna be left up to, you know, testing and finding out how much, you know, content we can move through in a certain amount of time. Um, but the general workflow for us would be, especially if we wanted to use a, a tool like FITS, um, is to extract all the normalized metadata that it provides, store it in a separate database, and then, um, you know, either have it kept in that database or move to an external storage of some sort or that sort of thing, you know, whatever we decide to do with it. Um, you know, running characterization at ingest time makes sense. Um, but of course, like what we want to do for, you know, backfilling this information is a whole separate process. Um, you know, to, things to consider, uh, we did find that, uh, at least during the experimentation that we, uh, that we ran through for this past project, that um, some tools like Jove can actually slow down um, when, they're, when it's trying to, like, for, ex for example, accessing uh, a DTD, some sort of external resource that it needs. And it's probably not a big slowdown if you're doing a small amount of content, but if you're doing like literally like thousands and thousands of files, I'm sure that can impact the performance of the overall process. Um, database performance is another thing. And then microservice performance. Um, for us, we would have to figure out which is like for us, we have a we have a, a fixed D checking process that runs constantly. Do we build onto that and have it do the same kind of characterization um, process like you know as it goes through like file by file and is that an option that we can kick in for a certain periods of time that sort of thing um, but i'd be really interested in finding out like you know if anybody else has done this sort of work with jove or with fits um, you know and if you've processed a certain amount of files like uh, what what have you come across in terms of performance? Because you know it, it, it's really going to matter uh, at pretty much any scale. Um, but certainly, once you get into a good good number of files, you could everything could slow down. Um, and then, which files do we process? I think this is a pretty straightforward question. We wouldn't we wouldn't go through any of our system files. We just go through the producer files. Um, there was one note in the past uh, effort about using Jove 2 and that it kicked out 70 kilo, 70K worth of information for a 10K file, um, a little PDF or something like that. And it was just like, you know, I think that at least kind of opened our eyes a little bit about what's gonna be kicked out from each one of these, you know, file examinations. Um, and still even 70K is not all that much. Um, from what I found, and the few experiments that I did um, with FITS is after this metadata is normalized, it gets down to like maybe 7K. Um, so it's it's really not that much. Um, how do we filter out noise? I think this is a really big question though. Um, there's, you know, there's the potential for, if you're running something like FITS that encompasses many tools, um, it tries to normalize what comes out of it. Um, but then again, there are going to be conflicts and there's going to be some, there are going to be times where it's not going to, there's going to be information that you literally have to sift through. Um, so a few of the examples here, like, uh, you know, the pronoun unique identifiers that are out there per file format um, and the mind types that we already have, they can overlap. And sometimes there are, 20 or 30 different like uh, unique identifiers from Pronom for a single mind type. Um, like PDF is a, a perfect example of that. And so, you know, what do we want to, what do we want to capture? What do we not want to capture? Um, it's still pretty straightforward, but it's something to consider. Um, the multiple identifications um, or file extensions um, that, that are assigned to a single file um, this is this is what I've heard from the standpoint of Droid, which is a, a utility that uses Pronom um, and examines your files. Sometimes it actually assigns multiple IDs um, to every to a particular file. So um, 
that means that probably something in Pronom needs to be improved. So um, they, from what I saw, they're you know definitely asking for feedback. If you run across this sort of thing, they they're happy to improve the actual signatures they have for file formats. Um, so that's community input. Um, yeah, and that would be, but that's something you'd have to be concerned with. Um, okay, Nathan just mentioned, yeah, you've run into this issue with Droid. Um, is that something that's been pretty pervasive or is it something that you've run across like just a handful of times? I'm curious. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to say. Uh, this is a pretty heterogeneous um, born digital collection that really is kind of what kicked off our digital stewardship program. And we were trying to use Droid as part of a project to just kind of better understand kind of the scope of what's there akin to your JSON export, right, from Merit. And what we found was that these, well, like maybe not, the they were definitely the exception of the rule, I guess what I would say, but they were still pervasive enough that it made it difficult to confidently characterize what was present in the collection, if that makes sense. But that's a little bit different than something that's fully processed and has gone through whatever preparations you're doing for merit. Um, this was more of a, you know, a case where we'd harvested it off the hard drives and we were trying to characterize and mask what was there. And we're just running into these cases where, the, as you said, there might be 20 different IDs that are cobbled together and it was unclear why and sometimes difficult to discern the pattern. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, it definitely sounds like something that we'd have to be aware of and handle. Um, and I guess it would, you know, it really depends on what the source is for a particular set of objects too. Like you're saying, if it's a hard drive or if it's something that um, that's well known and has already been, if, you know, if it's a submission from a, from a campus library that's been, you know, at least put together pretty well and it's straightforward then you know and it only contains like a few different file formats and it'd be different but yeah if there's a wide range of file formats and yeah yeah definitely be something to keep an eye on um cool thanks nathan appreciate it so the other um the other note that i have here about conflicting metadata uh, output from multiple PITS tools. Uh, we'll actually take a look at some of that um, and the examples that I'll show right at the end of the presentation. Uh, oops. Which is, yeah, I don't want to go into the directions yet. So let me just go ahead and bump out of here and um, have to share. everything. Okay. So this is actually, um, and please holler if this is too small to see, I'm hoping it's okay. Um, this is actually the output from fits for a uh, for a pretty, pretty small PDF file. Um, and you can see here, let's see, you've got all the different tools that it's running. Um, so um, it's using Droid, it's using Jove, it's using the standard file utility, the exit tool, all these different things, including Tika. Um, and then it kind of highlights what it found a conflict with right here near the top. Um, but what's, what's interesting though, is that the conflict um, is, I think it's basically down to this little symbol here at the end of Microsoft, the registered trademark symbol. Um, because if you look at the output from the next tool, there's no registered trademark symbol. Um, but these are, you know, so this is the difference between the exif tool output and then this this other tool. Um, and it's, I can imagine that, and here's actually another, another very minor conflict, but um, the only difference here is that there's not the minus eight hours on the end of it for the last modified timestamp. Uh, versus the Z. And so it's, I can just imagine that seeing these kinds of conflicts at scale uh, would be would be difficult um, to really go through. Um, oh, by the way, thanks, Michelle, for mentioning that you guys can see this. Um, 
yeah, so it's this is only about 7K worth of output. Um, and there are only a couple of conflicts in here. Uh, there's a lot of other, you know, decent information um, that we could easily store. Uh, you know, um, so I, I don't, you know, to me, uh, there's a list of fonts here. Um, there's information about, uh, you know, what else came through, um, whether it's a timestamp or the file, um, anything like that, the MD5 checksum. Um, so yeah, it's, to me, this would be very useful to store and to be able to actually parse through, um, to, to find, to determine like exactly what we wanted to surface with each different file format. I don't think that would be feasible given the number of different file formats that are out there. Um, but yeah, this is, to us, I think this is just a big, big puzzle we would have to put together uh, and to, to find out, you know, what's gonna be valuable for our users, um, what are the things that we do and don't wanna highlight, all that sort of stuff. Um, there are a couple of other like sample files that I've got here. These are actually, um, very similar in terms of like the resulting output. There are a couple of conflicts, but um, it's, you know, very straightforward. Again, the timestamp is a little bit different. Um, and that was it. That was the only problem that was found or conflict that was found for here that we might have to, uh, you know, try to figure our way around. Um, and that's not a, that's certainly an easy problem to, to surmount. Um, and then for this file, this is actually a PDF file. Um, you can see that Oh, here's one thing I didn't mention before is that um, here's the, the pronom uh, unique ID that's being mentioned, this X format 92. Um, yeah, there's not, I mean, this is very consistent information that we could actually capture um, and make use of. Um, let's see. So the other. Um, I'm not sure if folks have gone through this uh, at all, but this is, you know, I just did want to mention like, here's the pronom registry um, of all these different uh, formats. And this is just an example for, for PDF. You can see that they have four, different, this is of course a unique example because of the complexities of different flavors of PDF that are out there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gives you a lot of information about all the different flavors of PDF and it, you know, provides you with different, um, and let's swap through here. Um, here are the unique, I, oh, no, okay, this is just a search for the unique identifiers. Actually, I think this page was cached and now I'm running into problems. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there, people can see. Um, so yeah, that um, pretty much the last thing I wanted to mention is just really what we're gonna try to do is evaluate our users find analogs that are out there, um, you know, for folks who have actually been working with characterization at a different scale or at the same scale. Um, and then, you know, if there's significant interest that's, that's, you know, bubbling up, then we should, you know, we should spend the time and if we can, if we have the bandwidth to actually experiment with some of these tools. So, uh, and that is the end of the presentation. So let me stop sharing. Um, I want to basically invite any questions that are out there. I have one. Oh, hi, Michelle. Hi, uh, Michelle Cornell University. Um, uh, very early in this presentation, you actually made mention of something that preys and weighs heavily on our minds at Cornell, which is um, how much is it really worth doing file characterization? Uh, specifically, um, this idea that we might su be supporting some kind of use case for large scale migration for a format that falls um, out of ubiquity and, or is proprietary in some way. And um, I think. Uh, Diane, who I think just joined the call, uh, recently shared within our local team uh, the observation that anything that happens to a file usually happens on the collection level. It doesn't tend to happen on this large scale. And that thing that happens might be very particular for that collection. So I, I, I'm kind of interested in hearing from the group uh, whether or not 
uh, large scale format migration is really a thing or is actually just some kind of imagined use case. And that maybe we ought to be thinking at in a more uh, selective or more targeted way about how we might engage with um, the collections that we have that we're preserving. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a question we have as well. That's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, my, I, when I started with digital preservation, I was really inclined to swallow that line, hook, line, and sinker. And now I'm actually quite skeptical of it. So I'm, I'm really, really interested in what others have to think about that. Well, this is Leah. I can give an example of sort of a use case where I do think sort of large scale um, migration is warranted. So we participate in a consortial level uh, digital preservation of born digital material, legal born digital materials. I'm at a law library. Um, and because everybody's, because there was an agreement at the very beginning about the nature of the kinds of things that we were saving and the format that we were saving them in, which is primarily PDF, uh, we have had discussions recently about wholesale migration, for instance, from an older version of PDF to a newer version of PDF, or some, some institutions have, uh, have uploaded things like Word files, and we've talked about a wholesale migration of Word, Word files to PDF. So I think, I think it depends on the project. I think within a given institution, you're probably that's what you're describing is probably more common, but there are cases where sort of there's a large scale, very agreed upon activity going on where you're actively collecting and saving as opposed to bringing in a collection that existed that you would wanna make a more granular decision on. Uh, so that's one, one use case that I can uh, give you. This is Adrian Hansen. I'm at University of Georgia. We probably wouldn't do mass migration, but what we are doing at the bigger scale is the technology watch. So that's sort of so as the preservation person, I'm trying to keep an eye on which formats might be obsolete. And then the departments would have an extra filter of is this collection worth it to decide if they want to migrate or not. Um, but I do need that big picture so I know what we have a lot of so I can keep an eye on it. Yeah, so in that case, would you need file identification or would you need full characterization? Right now, what we have is FITS output um, because that's the best we can do with our sort of technology. Um, and, you know, it gives us our early warning sign anyway if, if things are about to go out. But uh, definitely running into, you know, like Eric is showing, there is a lot of noise in the data where you're not quite entirely sure what a lot of it is. And so we're just keeping it all right now because we don't have the capacity to figure out which one's right, you know, when it kicks out different possibilities. Yeah, Michelle, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on what Adrian was saying there. And this is something that I mentioned on an earlier call and it was sort of an oddball project. So I'll, I'll do my best to explain it and make it sound a little less oddball, but it really speaks to the question of the noise and the usability of this for looking at broad trends within a repository or within a data set. Uh, in, in, the, in the case of what we were working on as a project, this was to explore different trends of technology and, and uh, an adoption of file formats or software within a particular type of office that you know, our institutions collected a lot from, in this case, congressional offices. And, uh, you know, we actually, in a lot of cases, sort of walked the data back from file format characterization to meme type in order to actually more broadly understand what was going on. Now, in some cases, we could do really interesting things with the file format characterization within a file family, sort of like, it was like looking at the DNA of PDF adoption or JPEGs within an office was really, really curious and interesting. But in, actually, in actuality, to make the data usable for that type of, um, of activity, uh, you would have to look a lot more like what Eric was, was showing initially. I mean, I was sort of jealous of that actually. Like I, if I could just spit out that sort of output um, for 
the type of collections that we're talking about, it'd be a lot easier to make those sort of distinctions. But the noise was was present enough, independent of the issue with Droid that I was talking about, that um, it it made a distinction like that difficult because you could you could come up with you know pronoun categories you know that were in the dozens for JPEGs because that that file format's been around so long. And so making that broad characterization was really tough actually in some cases. Yeah, I mean, speaking of, of broad characters or, or just like broad categories, I mean, if, if um, you know, the, the DPC has their, their bit list that's out there, but it is, you know, from what I've seen and, and please anybody, you know, chime in with more info because I'm, you know, just getting into it like, it seems like very broad categories of different um, types of content where they're expressing whether or not, um, you know, this type of content and given its file formats, you know, you should be paying attention because these things are, you know, going the way of the dodo kind of thing. These are, these are going away. Um, and, you know, but it, from what I've seen, you know, so far, and this is, you know, it's super useful information. Um, yeah, making decisions about individual flavors of JPEG or PDF or things like that, uh, you know, to find that sort of guidance at a very granular level would be very tough, I think. And maybe that's something that you come across just with having your, you know, having done some of this and having stored a lot of data and, and just having some history behind it, um, which of course, you know, nobody has when they first start out. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a great point, Eric. And I, I would say that, you know, an interesting use case that we run into would be TIFFs that have odd tag fields associated with them so that they will no longer render in kind of a, a standard graphics program now, either because they were created on some sort of legacy scanner or something that was just adding another field in there that's not recognized. I'm not, I would have to go back and check this, but if memory serves, I don't think that those are getting flagged as a particular pronoun category that would set them apart from other TIFFs. It's just that they have, like, sometimes they would throw a warning, sometimes not, but it wasn't like they were a separate characterization that would then allow us to know, like, okay, that flavor of TIFF is poisoned and we need to do something about it. But I'd have to go back and check on that. I'm not 100% certain if those were getting warned or not in their system. Right, right. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Um, do well, we're we're at ten of. Um, do folks have other other questions or input? This has been a, a great conversation. And if not about characterization, if anybody has any thoughts or recommendations, we're, we're looking for ideas and topics that people would like to hear about or lead a discussion about, or it doesn't have to be a presentation, or if you'd be interested in having another session where it's, it's sort of an open forum for people to bring problems that they're having, that they'd like some input on from the rest of the group. Love to hear from you about any of those uh, formats for future meetings. And if you don't have ideas at the moment, you can always email Eric and I if you do going forward. So Eric, do you have other things that you think we need to talk about? Um, no, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, but yeah, definitely if, if uh, people have ideas about uh, formats of the meeting or anything like that, please feel free to, to add them to our, our running notes document or just, you know, get in touch directly with Lee and I. Um, um, yeah, that sounds great. So, okay. All right. Um, Leah, is there anything else you wanted to, to cover? Or? No, just to thank you for your interesting contemplation of characterization. <laughs> yeah, definitely contemplation, yeah, yeah. Sure thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. It was great seeing everybody here. And uh, we'll hope to see you next month. Bye.
Bye, y'all. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye. Bye.